Salutations, people. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into the murder cases that went unnoticed by our nation's newspapers. Hi, Shay. Hi, John. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Welcome back. Welcome to Page 3 Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, Season 2, Episode 28. We're going to be talking mobsters. I feel, feel like kind of the right time. Huh? What are you trying to say? I plan it. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the Collinwood, uh, Collinwood Manor Massacre. Ooh, it's a little tough to say that, but um, relatively case uh, involving a couple of offshoots of like uh, mob activity. So it's the mob. Where's Collingwood? Uh, I believe this takes place in Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's either De- uh, Detroit or Chicago. Um, cause well, it makes sense if it's gangsters. One came from one area and one came from the other. Um, yeah, so this, I, I was right. This whole thing takes place in Detroit itself. And you know what? I was just like, oh, man. Uh, we did, uh, last season, we did that case on the Cullen, uh, Collinwood uh, Ripper. Or Strangler. Is it the same Collinwood? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's crazy. Don't move to Collinwood. Apparently they, uh... No bueno. Yeah. So I was uh, listening to another podcast um, that I enjoy listening to. It's true crime, paranormal stuff. Um, and they were actually talking about food murders this week and I, I I just got reminded of that one southern um Libby and you were just like oh maybe no good should work there <laughs> a high rate of uh, volume of uh, violence being uh, oh yeah there's, there's like multiple things that happen at Libby's yeah and, and I believe we talked about it last season and you were just like, oh. Yeah, so Libby's is the Collinswood of Collingwood of, of stores to work at. So is there a Libby's inside of Collingwood? I have no that idea. would be the worst place on the planet to work. Uh, yeah, your odds are astronomically high. Any other place, but no, you go there, you got a one in ten chance. One in ten customers. <laughs> guys out there want to support the podcast remember you can like share and subscribe and that is free um or you can donate as little as a dollar on patreon leave a comment yeah comments are great i love them well i the only people who leave comments are british people apparently yeah we our british following is very strong with the comments love you guys (laughs) all right so let's get into our news now that we've Everybody and done all that. So this case uh, takes place in 1931. So around this time, we've got several things going on um, that are really big things. Um, so you know, we have the prohibition. We have the U.S. occupation of Haiti. Uh, the Great Depression is in full swing, uh, and the Dust Bowl out in the mid- Midwest. Why is one of these, like, half of a book? Uh, <laughs> it was just uh, notes from the book. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to start off in January. Uh, the American Federation of Labor's National Committee for Modification of the Volstead Act uh, is formed to work toward the repeal of prohibition in the United States. 
Did we already do this one? Did we already do this year? That sounds familiar. Well, we, we did the year that it was actually repealed. Oh, okay. So this so is the beginnings. The, the beginning and the ends. Yeah. And then we have in February. No, we've definitely done this because I remember the next two. The food rides in Minneapolis and the Star Spangled Banner. This to you the other day. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> I was like, ah, this. Because I normally go into these like uh, pretty. Pretty blind. And I'm like, yeah. I remember all of this stuff. Yeah. The last time we recorded earlier this week, I pulled it up for you. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So, February, we have the food riot. Uh, food riots break out in Minneapolis and other parts of the United States. Um, yeah. Then, uh, on March 3rd, the United States, we adopted our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. That is surprising to me that it was, you know... So I wonder when we finally selected and the fact that we picked a British drinking song theme that put it to hilarious. So my question is like how uh, how popular was the song prior to this? Was it just some obscure song that we decided to pick? Or was it like something that people kinda knew already? Alright. So it was something that people kinda knew already. But it wasn't like everybody thought it was the national anthem. We didn't have one at the it wasn't thought of as a national anthem yeah. until then. And it it was um it was a poem, right? That they put to yeah. a British drinking song. And it was kinda of popular to like sing at bars and taverns and stuff. Um yeah, that's it's kind of a weird when you really think about it, it's kind of a weird drinking song. March 17th, uh, Nevada legalized gambling. It was all downhill from there. I know. The mob. Mob ties in, in Nevada. Yeah. Real tight. Um, so, on June 19th, um, basically, everybody knows this is like the lead up to World War II, right? So, we have the huge banking crisis in Central Europe. And President Herbert Hoover issues the Hoover Moratorium. Uh, and do you want to just give them a brief summary of what that is, Dave? I'm not even 100% sure. Yeah. Okay, so the Hoover mo- Moratorium uh, was a public uh, statement issued by our president on the June 20th. With the hope that oh, they okay. Would ease the economic crisis internationally. So basically, what was happening? Okay, so Germany is printing money faster than they can possibly ever spend it, uh, crashing the Deutschmark. Uh, this is the Weimar Republic. Um, so they have some hyperinflation going on, and their economy is basically just garbage. And so Hoover, instead of because they still owed, you know. Lots and lots and lots and lots of money. All the other European countries. Yeah. First World War. And they really weren't accepting Deutschmarks because they were worthless. Yeah. Like, there's literally photos of people carrying wheelbarrows full of Deutschmarks to... I think they're Deutschmarks. They might not even have been Deutschmarks. It might have been something else at the time. Um, they're, like, literally carrying wheelbarrows of paper money yeah. to, to the grocery store. Um... And so they're like, yeah, maybe you don't have to pay the payments for a little bit just to get yourselves on your feet. Yeah. Uh, turns out it was probably about five years too late. Actually, I mean, it was 20 years too late, but yeah. it's a different story. Because um, Hitler was already uh, already convinced everybody that uh, they got the roll into the deal. Which is why Hitler was able to gain such power so quickly um, within his party. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, that in the commons. Pretty much all the like France was like completely against um, allowing, like delaying the payments from Germany to like. So 
that they could stabilize their their uh, economy a little bit. Now you see. They were like, no, we want our money. France. Everyone complains about France losing wars quickly. No, no, no. France's problem is they made too many bad decisions outside of the wars. Because if you look at, I mean, if you look at World War One, France was probably prior to World War One. France, I believe, had the strongest military in Europe. Yeah, they were considered the best fighters in Europe. They also, you know, invented smokeless powder. They had a lot of the, a lot of stuff going for them. Like at a time when, no, they won them both, babe. Calm down. World War One. Germany invades your entire country. That was only World War Two. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then even if even after they surrendered in World War Two, they still fought. It, it was only about half. Like Germany occupied Paris, but that's why I have you there. You're like, yeah, the French are underrated. You're, you're already like ready for like, France gets bad rap. That's what I'm saying. You're ready for, like, the dad books on, like... The Although they need to stop... <laughs> they need to stop making stupid decisions outside of the wars. That was a problem. They made any use of the war, though? I do like how the um, French people uh, like to fight their cops. I love it. Have you, have you seen the... the oh, the yellow the jackets? Department? Yeah, just lighting themselves or on yellow fire. coats, whatever they call them. In businesses. Yeah, people that, you know. Pe pe people are actually helping the community. We destroy them. Yeah. Like, uh, Philly. Remember we went down, like, the, the week afterwards, and they were still had, like, all the burnout cop cars sitting there on the street? Crazy. Yep. Crazy. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on to our next one, uh, which is June 23rd. So we have the Smiley Post. Round the world flight on my Kindle and Wayfair. So I want to know what defines around the world because I can go around the world in two seconds. If you're at the North Pole, you just boop, done. <laughs> I'm around the world. Like, did they go around the equator? Did uh, they? Did they? Did they truly circumnavigate the globe, uh, or is, did they just cheat? I don't even think they. I don't even think that they completed it. Well, yeah, it said attempted, yeah. so they failed miserably, yeah, but. So what it was, it was, it was probably along that um, latitude, longitude line. Uh, so it cheated. Around, yeah, so it would be the northern hemisphere. Uh, cheating the cheaty faces. Now we're going to move into our TV side. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, the first one. And I might have brought these guys up previously um, in regards to different Case that I was talking about um, down in the south um, that was uh, a little similar. So on March 25th, we have uh, the Southboro boys uh, who are arrested in Alabama and charged with uh, sexual activity. Now, this was the allegation uh, that nine African American teenagers aged between 13 and 20, uh, and they were accused of raping two white women in 1931. Uh, and it's a landmark case uh, for the incident dealing with racism and the right to a fair trial. Because uh, this case uh, basically had a lynch mob involved. Uh, Remember that, Alabama. Jury. Every time you complain about the rioting going on nowadays, yes. you were the ones doing it back in the day. Somebody say, um, oh, well, you know, when, when white people protest, we don't tear cities down. I'm like, we used to. The, like, there's there's incidences of us burning the, like, the, the, uh, the courts down. Because 
because of it. Like, yeah, so. Because it kind of backed up or whatever. Like, so, I don't know. Like, because they're just weird. It's because they're not doing it. Like, exactly. Everyone just, it's like, well, there's just, like, really simple, yeah. they're not educated. like, philosophical concept of you can never think you're wrong. It's not possible to think that you're wrong because if you thought you were wrong about something, you would just have a different opinion. Mm-hmm. So every you, which is crazy because that that means you have to think you're right about literally everything all the time. You can acknowledge that you were wrong in the past, but in present day, you cannot think that you're wrong about anything. And see, and that's every human being all the time yeah. thinks they're right about every single thing. They acknowledge the fact that they probably aren't statistically. I believe this is called the case of the blackbirds or the crows or something like that was a philosopher he wrote a book and in it he had wrote uh he, he had apologized for potentially getting something wrong and oh no that's right it was a history book where someone wrote it and he said hey i, I apologize if i got any of the facts wrong and it was just this guy's like well what facts did you get wrong just change them and he's like no no, no i i don't think i'm wrong about anything Statistically speaking, I'm, I probably wrote a, a date wrong down or something, and it just creates this like little little loop of you think you're right about everything, but you know you're wrong about something, but you can't identify it, so you think you you still think you're right about everything. Well, it's not a circular logic; it's a, a feedback loop, but. I don't know how we got all of that. Uh, no, I don't want to read this. I can't pronounce those. I want to hear what you have to say about it. <laughs> All right. So basically, we have a mob war. Uh, the Castaneris, uh War um, basically ends with the assassination of Joe the Boss Mascara. Uh, briefly leaving Salvatore Mazzolano as, uh, yeah, the boss of all bosses. I think it's so funny, like, mob bosses, like, if you just took the mob bosses out of context, you're just like, are you guys, like, six? Yeah. Be like, what? We're going to create this hierarchical structure. What are we going to call him? Well, he's the boss. Yeah, but who's his boss? Well, the boss of the bosses. Well, who's his boss? The boss of all the bosses. What do you mean? Kind of. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It makes me think that the world is just held together with duct tape. And no one knows what's going on. It is. Yeah. So, he basically crowns himself like the undisputed ruler of the American Mafia. Uh, and then he himself, six months later, is assassinated, uh, leading to the establishment of the five families in New York City. So we have 18-year-old uh, murderer Francis Two-Gun Frawley uh, surrendered after a two-hour gun battle in New York City with uh, the New York City Police Department. Uh, this is witnessed by 15,000 bystanders on uh, May 7th. And he was thought to be responsible for a bunch of murders. And his crime spree lasted nearly three months, uh, ending in, in that two-hour shootout on uh, May 7th. See, his problem is he he, uh, he boxed himself in. Yeah. He's two-gun Crowley, so, like, once you're out of the two guns, like, he had nothing left. If he would have been, like, three or four-gun Crowley, who knows? He may have gotten out of there. Gotta, sure gotta think about the these animal. things. <laughs> gotta think about these things before you start picking your nicknames, people. Unlimited Guns Crowley. More guns than the police Crowley. <laughs> That's what I'm going to name myself. Oh my 
whatever I need to get out of this situation pots. That's that's gonna be my nickname. <laughs> Can't box myself in. So imagine your nickname was like Six Foot Ladder Steve, but you needed an eight foot ladder to get out of wherever you're in. Like you're screwed. Just name yourself Tall Enough Ladder Steve. And you're like, problem solved. I don't know, see. You know where Six Ladder Steve probably got that nickname, though, was because he was probably tall enough <laughs> that he reached the top of a six foot ladder. So he basically, he's six feet tall. Stand on top of the the, the the very last rung of the six foot. He only had to step up two more feet. Well, like, what if your name was like, like Dollar Bill Kelly, and you walk in, the guy's like, "It's a dollar six, bro, tax." You're like, "Damn it, I should name myself Dollar Six Kelly." Like fifty cents, inflation, dude. Come on. Like, well, like, at, at now. Due to inflation, fifty cent now calls himself a dollar twenty five. <laughs> Not for killing a bunch of people, racketeering, prostitution, running casinos. Yeah. Tax evasion. Not, not for any of that. Tax evasion. Shows you what the government's interested in. Well, it was the only thing. Hey, prove. hey, we don't we don't care that you were a pimp. You killed people. You stole. You you, you bootlegged everything. But. And here's the thing: if he would have just given him a share, he'd have been fine. I know. If he'd have just slid them a bribe, just slid them a little bribe, they'd have been like, no, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, buddy. You keep on doing you. We'll keep on not doing us. He was in Philly. They still got his thing. Yeah, and then he went. He was out of right? I have no idea. I know his cell. I think they let him out because he was all like syphilis up. But his cell is still in the condition it was when he left, with a carpet and a nice bed. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the Purple Gang was involved in several illegal activities in the 1920s and 30s. And most of those everybody knows is going to be gambling, drug distribution, bootlegging, uh, certain uh, like unions. They, were, they had their hands in unions. Uh, Lost in some knees. Yeah, and they had uh, an extortion rack. You know, protection racket going um, for different places. Now, in 1927, uh, the Purple Gang was at the top of their game running the Detroit underworld. When three Chicago gunmen uh, who fled, fled to Detroit from Chicago um, start weaseling in on 
some of the Clever Games stuff, you know? Uh, and those three Chicago guys would be Joseph Leibowitz, uh, Herman Penny Paul, that was his nickname, was Penny. Um, and Isidore Izzy the Rat Cupcake. See, that's a cool nickname. Izzy the Rat. Yeah, his name's Isidore. I like that. I like that name, Isidore. So, these guys uh, show up in Detroit. And they make the mistake of shaking down a Chicago speakeasy. Uh, are... Okay, so the reason why they're in Detroit is because they, they basically shook down the wrong speakeasy uh, for protection money. So, like, they were trying to, like, do their do an extortion racket in Chicago. And it just so happened to be uh, a place run under Al Capone syndicate for purchasing liquor from his supply. So Al Capone was not too happy with it. So he basically gave them an ultimatum. He told them, you either leave Chicago willingly, like on your own, or you're leaving in a box. So they were either leaving Chicago dead or alive. Uh, And they chose to leave alive. So they decided, okay, well, we're just going to leave. We're going to go to Detroit. So after arriving in Detroit, uh, the men soon become affiliated with a small faction of the Purple Death, uh, which was the Little Jewish Navy. That was their their little offshoot. And their, their main racket was to bring alcohol over from Canada. Um, and they used speedboats that they, that they had, like they made or whatever, uh, to run liquor from Canada to Detroit. Uh, and then they would, I'm assuming, hand it off to the Purple Gang, and the Purple Gang would sell it. And there would be an exchange of funds, you know, for the, for the work. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, the only problem is, uh, they very soon uh, lose, you know, some trust between them and the Purple Gang. Because Leibowitz, Paul, and Seltzer decide to hijack members of the gang uh, hi- and basically like, hey, yeah, you know, you should join us. And they start playing on other local gangs, like gang members, uh, regarding territory. So they, they're like, well, why are we, you know, working underneath these guys? We should, you know, be in charge of a racket of our own. Like, we don't need them to. So they start weaseling in on uh, taking people from their, from, they basically, basically talk them into joining them, and then they start messing up a bunch of stuff. So they were trying to establish themselves as an independent power, uh, and they nicknamed themselves, get this, uh, the Third Avenue Terrors. Again, bad nickname. Mm-hmm. What if you gotta go to Fourth Avenue? You're screwed. Whatever Ev, I need to work on terrors. That should be their name. <laughs> Avenue X terrors. That would be a good one. That that's a good one. Yeah. Avenue X terrors. But but you could only be on X parallel. No that. Like, so no X as in a. Yeah, I know what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Like X as in unknown. Not not a Cartesian plane, <laughs> but as in X as in a variable. that the 3rd Avenue Terrors needed to go. So now we're going to talk about the actual massacre. Now, after uh, failing to pay back uh, due debts uh, to the Purple Gang, uh, Ray uh, Bernstein, Bernstein, uh, one of the founders of the gang, 
comes the plan to get rid of, aka kill, uh, kill some evil with Merman, Paul, and Isadora Chuck, uh, Chuckster. Now, Ray, uh, Burns, uh, Bernstein, uh, would use Paul Levine, uh, as an unknown accomplice in the crime. Now, Levine was a good friend of both groups, so he kind of didn't know what was going to go down. Now, the plan was to start off by buying an apartment at the Collinswood Manor Apartments, which is where our, our murder gets its name. And Ray then convinces Saul uh, that the Purples decided to basically let Evil with Paul and Sucker be their agents in uh, the liquor business. So he was to set up a meeting for all the men at this apartment. And that meeting was set up for September 16th, 1931. So Levine uh, and everybody meet up at, you know, at the Collinswood Ave. I'm not going to give the address. I do have the address here. I'm not going to give it because I don't want to be sure. I don't know if I can find it. Now, after engaging in a quick conversation, uh, Ray uh, Bernstein uh, left to go get the getaway car. So he just said he was going to step out for like a quick second. Uh, he waited for uh, the sound of backfiring uh, and honk the horn guys in the apartment that he was ready up. I love the fact that they like already knew it was going to backfire because these are 1930s cars. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. So our guy one of the purple gang guys of Flasher I always call him Flasher Flasher killing him. Uh, Irving uh, Melberg and Harry Keywell, they jump up and begin to start shooting. Now, here's a note for you. Keywell, uh, Harry, uh, Harry Keywell, he also took part in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre along with other Purple Gang members. So, he likes the massacres. What can you say? So Keywell empties his entire revolver into his evil ass sucker. <laughs> our, our guy, Isadora. Uh, and Melberg empties his into Herman Paul. Who is him. While this is all happening, <laughs> Saul Le uh, Levine is just standing there helplessly watching this like he doesn't understand what's going on he's like kind of freaked the fuck out yeah and he just stands there and watches as these these guys try to like get out and save their lives and stuff but they they don't make it out of that apartment now after uh killing those guys Witness, Soul Levine, uh, just dumbstruck there. Now, the officers, police get called and they show up and they, they basically find Soul Levine uh, at the apartments. Uh, they take him into their headquarters uh, and go through a very long interrogation with him. Uh, he finally confessed the scene the murders take place. And named the parties involved. Like, what else is he supposed to do? I mean, yeah, the cops are going to beat it out of him anyway. 
Well, it's not just that, but like, what are you supposed to say when you're just found with three dead guys surrounding you? Yeah. With, you know, you're just like, uh, wasn't me. <laughs> and I had my eyes closed the whole time. <laughs> so. Yeah, like, that's not really going to fly with the cops. They're like, wait a minute, you had your eyes closed the entire time. You like, listen, I did ball. not, I did not catch the names of the gentlemen. I'm I sorry. My ne- my glasses got my glasses even fell then. Off. Uh, they were on the floor. I was crawling around looking for them. Found this dead guy. Didn't find my glasses though. <laughs> yeah. So they go through this interrogation. He finally names everybody. Now after his confession, uh, an anonymous call is received by the detective's office, uh, and that message states. And this is in quotation, so this is what, what was said on the on the call. Um, two of the men you want for the Collinwood uh, murders are at 20, I guess 123. Uh, they will be out of town within the hour. So they, they gave the address. I didn't want to give you guys the address of that place. Once again, I don't want people showing up at somebody's house. That would be kind of rude. Yeah, so... Somebody makes this anonymous call to the cops. No, no, they didn't. Yeah, no. It was a clever ploy to try and hide the identity of the person who gave it up. That's all it was. Yeah. Now, heavily armed, uh, the cops show up at this uh, place, uh, which was owned by Charles Arbach. Arbach. Auerbach. See, that's what I want to be. An underworld consultant? Yeah. Like a Moriarty? Criminal consultant? I guess so. You just got to be like, you know, it's all plausible deniability. I didn't do anything. They asked for some advice, I gave them some advice. What do you want from me? Like, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but I gave them some advice. Mm-hmm. Client confidentiality prohibits me from discussing what we discussed. So, Ray Bernstein uh, and Harry Sewell are arrested at that location in their pajamas. That's funny. Right? Just, like, old-timey pajamas. With, like, the flap? Yeah. (laughs) Just being walked out, handcuffed, heavily armed police officers on flanking you on all sides. Uh, and they were basically caught while preparing to skip town. I, listen. So, Irving Melberg was arrested uh, the following night, um, but, uh, Flesher, uh, disappeared. They couldn't find him. Now, they were able to locate the guns used in the crime, which had their serial numbers scratched off, and they were thrown into paint to try to cover up any uh, evidence that could be found on there. Unfortunately, they weren't up to snuff with ballistics. Uh, They didn't exactly understand the vaccine on the bullet from the gun. So, uh, ballistics tests uh, taken shortly afterwards uh, proved that the guns uh, that they found matched the bullet striations of the bullets found at the scene in the body. I don't know why they wouldn't just ditch them. I know. They're probably cheap little J-frame revol- revolvers. Like, just toss them into the into the drink. I mean, they got a... See, they got a... Or Chicago's got the river, right? Does Detroit have... Yeah, Detroit's got a big old river. Yeah, it's... then why not just toss them in? Like, they'll never find them. What are they going to do? Especially back then. There's no way. We should have just gotten rid of them. 
throw them in the sewer or something. I guess they wanted to save the extra couple of dollars. That was dumb. I'm just saying. If you're if you're a uh, criminal of the underworld, you get another one very easily. You don't need it. Yeah, I was about to say, it's not like they would just be without... I mean, maybe... You know, like, they them in paint and stuff, so it's not like they were usable. Yeah. Exactly. So why keep them? Like, come on. Just toss them in the, in the river if you don't need it. Um... All right, so the trial uh, for the Conwood Manor Massacre began on September 30th, uh, 30th 1931. That was really quick. Uh, this like this is like back in the day when, like, man, that, that was only like a few months, not even. That was pretty quick. So, Sol Levine appeared uh, at the pretrial, but was frightened about testifying against the men, uh, but... He did show up to the pretrial, uh, and he pointed uh, to Bernstein, Sewell, and Melberg uh, as the men who killed uh, Joseph Leibowitz, Herman Paul, and Isidore Schuster. Now, he said that Harry uh, Flaxen, Flesher, sorry, uh, also took part in the shooting, but he was not present at the trial obviously because he disappeared they couldn't find him this guy was smart he like automatically got out of town like he just he just scrubbed everything just disappeared um these other guys they were dumb and they waited too long to leave the scene now during his testimony uh levine uh focused solely on the prosecutor and did not once look at the men that he was accusing of murder uh, in contrast, uh, Bernstein, uh, Keywell, and Melberg uh, all focused their main attention on him while, during his testimony uh, and glared at him the entire trial, apparently. Like you, like you would, you know, he's ratting you out. But, I mean, you did just kill three people, so. Don't know if you get to, to take the moral high ground on that one, right? mad at somebody for, for ratting you? Well, no, they were trying to intimidate him. It has nothing to do with being mad. They were just like, you know, you know what's coming. Now, on October 2nd of 1931, uh, the men were uh, arraigned before Judge Donald Van Zeal. Uh, after a motion for dismissal of Levine's claim uh, was denied. So, they, their attorney was basically like, this guy didn't see anything. He's lying. Um, you should dismiss what he says. And then all I had to do was like, this guy's in fear for his life. Why would he just make this shit up? Yeah, exactly. Like, this is obviously not the case where you're just like, yeah, I'm going to make this off to try and piss off the entire mafia. Yeah, so the judge was like, nah, denied. Um, all right, so they go, they get arraigned. Uh, and they are ordered... they were not allowed to, to leave. Um, testimony for the case uh, began on November 2nd, 1931, for the trial, uh, with uh, Levin uh, giving, starting his account of what happened on the day of the massacre. So he basically, you know, tells them what happened and everything. Now, eight detectives uh, constantly guard him, uh, and ten stood guard during the trial with four uh, on point as he testified uh, as he feared that he would be killed during the case. Um, yeah, which doesn't seem too far-fetched. I mean... Now, witness after witness went to the stand testifying against the gang members claiming to have seen them run from the building after hearing uh, all the gunshots. Now, after closing argument, uh, the jury began a short deliberation which lasted only an hour and 37 minutes. Now, after which the jury returned the verdict, finding the men guilty of the charge of first-degree murder. So, I think the hour and 37 minutes, they weren't really arguing. Uh, They're just doing the due diligence. Yeah, they probably did not have, like, anything to say, like... Making sure it was first-degree murder, making yeah, sure it was, you know... Which 
is to be classified as and understand what the, the penalties are for each one of those. So yeah. And they, they are charged with first degree murder, um, which I believe is the worst. Yes. Yeah. So the members of the Purple Gang are convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole and are sent to Dave Marquette. Marquette Prison. Uh, I really, I got excited. I, for, I thought that was the. the That's not Marinette. Yeah. <laughs> so the chief detective, uh, James D. Uh, McCarty, uh, made a statement to the press and do you want to read that statement this conviction is the greatest accomplishment in years not only does it break the back of the purple gang but it serves notice to other mobs that murder doesn't go anywhere in detroit yeah. they were wrong yeah, <laughs> yeah detroit mm. now it was the beginning of the end uh for the notorious purple gang uh, on June 9th, 1932, uh, Harry Fletcher uh, surprised the prosecutor by strolling into the prosecutor's office uh, with his attorney, uh, who, y you know, just turned himself in on the warrant for his arrest for the Collinwood massacre. Now, during the nine months that he was missing, he was suspected in a couple of major crimes, including the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, which was huge. Now, by July 25th, 1932, the prosecutor, uh, Harry Troy, uh, or Toy, Harry Troy, uh, was forced to uh, admit that the eyewitness, Sol Levine, could not be found. So either he... Uh... He he deuced out, or there was most likely what happened is he, either one he was killed, or two there was an arrangement where he would disappear himself. Yeah. Uh, and if not, and then so this guy is like, all right, they have no witnesses. I can turn myself in. Mm -hmm. Then when I'm found not guilty, it's double jeopardy, so I can't be tried again, even if they ever find him. Yeah. So true. The case against. Eventually dismissed, and the judgment against uh, Bernstein, Keywell, and Melberg were all held because uh, they had the testimony on record. Now, there was an option to reopen the case uh, if new evidence was ever discovered. So um, that would be called with yeah. without prejudice. Yeah, so it was dismissed without prejudice. Um, I do not believe that they ever got the evidence to to convict this guy because that's where you would need the you would need Mr. Levine. Yeah. And now, mind you, he was a gangster himself. Yes. So he was not a good guy. Okay, so my my understanding, I'm not sure if he was he was affiliated with them, but I'm not sure that if he was actually okay. a gangster. Well, so what I'm saying is he was not a good guy. Like, he was in a rock and a hard place, and he had to do what he had to do. Yeah. Well, he and he didn't know about the whole thing going down. Well, he didn't know they were going to be murdered, but he was just mediating a meeting between two factions to, uh, for like this liquidation. Yeah. So he thought he was just sitting down, uh, inviting like them over and having like like a, a meeting. Well, I think you're missing what I'm trying to say. Oh, uh, okay. That he was always out for himself. Oh, uh, yeah. So he wasn't just like a good Samaritan being a witness and he was scared to get whacked because he was testifying. He was a bad man himself. And so after the fact, he probably would have taken a pretty good, like, if someone approaches him and drops a bag of money and goes, you're never going to be heard from again. Yeah, he goes, you got it, buddy. Yeah. And deuces out and is living in Mexico or something. Yeah. That would be the way I would handle it. Yeah. Instead of trying to kill the guy, because then you, then you always yeah, risk. Yeah, you know, there's, always, there's always risks. But you go to the guy with a fistful of cash dollar bills, and you go, you don't testify in this case again. Also, also Jimmy Hoffa. Who knows what happened to him? I think think they, didn't they, they just find him? This was the, no, uh, no, yeah, they just found him. 
I can't remember. I thought they found him. Oh, I'm going to have to look this up. Because I was, like, my, okay, so my theory was, that, you know, they said, oh, yeah, he got whacked, and they buried him underneath of that. Um, because at the time, they were building that one He's in a stadium. stadium. He's in a giant stadium. Yeah. I was like, nah, they did ground-penetrating radar, didn't find anything. Um, so my, my guess was like, oh, yeah, that's what happened. They dropped a bag of money at his feet and said, get out of here. Yeah. We don't want to see you again. Nobody needs to find you ever again. And he just disappeared into, like, some... He lives in South America or whatever, yeah, just South, chilling. Like, South America country, like, or, like, overseas in, like, in, in Asia somewhere. Like, just living out a good life. That was my theory. But if they found him, I want to know where... Go to the Wikipedia. Like, there's no way it's going to be updated immediately. Why wouldn't it be? It, it, like, it gets updated within seconds of this stuff. Investigation, crime development. And maybe they didn't find him, but I think they figured out, basically figured out what happened. That's why I was less than hoping it's the new one. Like, the most recent 23 hours ago. All right, I don't think we need to be doing this. Okay. Yeah. So, that is that is our case. Uh, I don't think they found Jimmy Hoffa. He's still not found. Um, that's what I think. I think he, he got a bag of money and walked away. Because they haven't found his body. I mean, come on. Why does everyone think he's dead? He's probably still alive at that rate. Uh, I mean, it would make him 92 years old. Yeah, well, he's probably dead now. <laughs> but he wasn't dead then. So, yeah. He could still be alive. 92? Yeah, no, he could be. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's close it out. I hope you guys enjoyed the case. Uh, we will be back with another one. Uh, and we're going to be going to Hollywood for that one. Hollywood, Florida? No, Hollywood. In Tennessee. Hollywood, Tennessee? No, Hollywood on the other coast. All the way. Keep going. California. Okay. All the way. All the way to the west. I'm pretty sure there's a Hollywood in like every state. Do you have a, do you have a Hollywood? It's like Springfield. <laughs> there's like 16 Springfields. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Massachusetts, Illinois, Pennsylvania. Do we have a Hollywood? I don't think there's a Hollywood, Pennsylvania. You know what? I. You know what I would like more than Hollywood? Think of other things you'd like. We should go there. No. I got I got the the Moderna vaccine, which was fully funded by Dolly Parton, Dollywood. All right, guys. We will see you back here for the next episode next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.